all for inviting me to come and, and speak to you about a program that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I tell you, the opportunity to serve as Chief Air Force Mars never entered my mind. But years ago, when I uh, joined the Air Force in 1985, I went up to the MEP station and was selecting uh, my career field. And I told the guy at that time, I said, I want to be a Mars operator. Because I had actually joined the program back in 1981. And uh, you can imagine you know, the funny look you get. <laughs> like, what? What's a Mars operator, you know? And uh, so I ended up uh, going into another career field, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But here I am at the twilight of my career, and I'm finally getting to get to do the job that I wanted to do from the beginning. So God is good. <clears throat> well, it is a great honor for me to be here. I tell you, I've heard so much about the uh, St. Louis and Suburban Radio Club over the years. Uh, I grew up in Marissa, and so I've known about the club for a long time, and I know all of you are very active and that you're doing a lot of really good things for the, uh, for the hobby here in the St. Louis area. You know, one of the amazing and uh, really humbling things about uh, serving and leading Air Force Mars is the absolutely unparalleled experience and expertise of our members uh, that we have. We have doctors, lawyers, uh, engineers, computer hardware, software, farmers, truck drivers, uh, retirees, and every imaginable career choice in between. And like I said, they're all volunteers. My, uh, my deputy, uh, Dr. Mark Allen, he uh, recently uh, used to work for Rhone. He has his PhD in electrical engineering, and I really rely on him quite a bit. A little give you a little bit of background about myself. I uh, retired as a master sergeant from the uh, Illinois Air National Guard in 2011. <clears throat> Before then, I uh, spent four and a half years in active duty, 22 years in the Air National Guard as a full-time technician. That is a program where you can serve in the National Guard, but you also work full-time Monday through Friday. So. Monday through Friday, I would come in as a civilian, but I wore my uniform. And then on the weekends, I'd come in, and I was paid uh, as an active, an active duty rank. So I did that for 22 years. Uh, I started out in electronic warfare, and I worked uh, B-52s, the F-4Es, and the F-16s. I'm sure some of you may have had some experience on, on some of those. Uh, the F-4E, I actually worked as a member of the 131st Fighter Wing here in St. Louis uh, before they moved uh, and uh, updated to their current airframe system. Uh, from electronic warfare, I went into avionics integrated systems, worked automatic, uh, automated test stations for the F-16, then the BRAC hit and turned our world upside down. I, at the time, I was uh, working at the 183rd Fighter Wing up in Springfield, Illinois, and <clears throat> we lost our F-16s. And so the opportunity to cross-train and come back home, actually, to Scott Air Force Base was presented to us, and I cross-trained into logistics. And I started out uh, supporting the uh, C-5, uh, weapon systems team. Uh, with the C-5, I worked with the uh, phase dock program, made sure that all the parts that they needed to fix the C-5 when it came into phase were there. And then after a few years, uh, I moved into the war reserve material program, and uh, from there I managed the, the TRAP program. TRAP stands for tanks, racks, adapters, and pylons. Basically, if it hangs on the aircraft, and the pilot can push a button and get rid of it when he has to go really, really, really fast. That was what I managed. So that was a trap. <clears throat> March of 2023, I uh, took the seat as 
Chief Air Force Mars, and I think Brendan probably called me the very first or second day uh, when I took the seat. So I was really happy to get that call, and, and here I am talking to you. I've been a licensed amateur radio operator since 1977. I hold the advanced class WD9HBA. And I had a couple of very uh, important Elmers uh, in my life. As, you, as I told you, I grew up in Marissa. And uh, so as a young kid coming out of the IGA one time, Bob Heil was there and he said, hey, Dave, I need you to come and help with a uh, March of Dimes walk -a -thon. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like fun. And uh, so Bob was very instrumental in me getting into amateur radio. And then during that walkathon, I uh, was paired up with another gentleman, WA9TZL, Gene Kramer. Uh, for those of you who are involved in the Skyward program, uh, you might hear Gene as our net control station over on the 147.12 machine. Gene has been involved in emergency management and in the Skyward program for, gosh, forever. Uh, since dirt was invented, and he does a fantastic job at that. And Gene was very instrumental in, uh, in part of Elmering me into the hobby. And then the other gentleman was my sixth grade science teacher, Mr. Clyde Bunty, who became known as Uncle Clyde to all of us, WB9, WFZ. And so if you're not an Elmer, find somebody to Elmer, because you never know where they're going to end up. I first joined the Mars program in 1981, and then life happened. I met this wonderful lady, my wife, uh, Cindy. Uh, I'm not supposed to call her my assistant, so she's not my assistant tonight. But Cindy and I got married January 5th of 1985, and we've had a wonderful uh, 38 years of marriage together and, and just loving life. And then, as I said, I'm also active uh, in the uh, St. Clair County Amateur Radio uh, Emergency Services. That's a little bit of background about myself. <clears throat> you know, like any program, the Mars program uh, continues to evolve as we adapt and we change uh, to technology as technology changes. Do we have any Mars members in the room? <coughs> former Mars. Former Mars? And you're a current former Mars? Army. Former Army Mars. Former Army, so very good. Well, thank you both uh, for being part of the program. And you know, one of the things that we find is as new members uh, come into the program, they bring with them new ideas and concepts that have really helped shape and improve the program. And then Mars adapts and pivots as it needs to to meet or exceed the expectations of our customer, which is the DOD. You know, many of our members have prior military service, and they see service in the Mars program as a way to continue the service to the Department of the Defense and to the nation. <coughs> you know, over the years, as with any organization, uh, realignments always occur, reorganizations occur, and in the DOD, of course, it's no different. In uh, 2019, uh, the Air Force established the Cyber Space Capabilities Center. We call it the Triple C. And they did so by combining uh, the Air Combat Command Cyber Space Support Squadron the Air Force Network Integration Center, and the 38th Cyberspace Readiness Squadron. So those three organizations now form the Triple C. And this new center is aligned under ACC and was designed to help the Air Force bridge the gap in cyber support enterprise requirements. Um, at the time, cyberspace was disjointed throughout the Air Force. They had little bits and pieces of it being managed by different organizations. And so they saw this as an opportunity to bring us all under one, uh, one roof, 
one commander and uh, it's working quite well. Air Force Mars, because we were a part of Air Force Communications and then AFNIC, we were rolled right into this and we now sit in the Global Communications branch within the Triple C. So my boss is the manager of the HF GCS program, the High Frequency Global <coughs> Communications System, which is a DOD owned uh, global network of 13 different high powered HF broadcast stations. And their whole purpose is to provide support to the president and also uh, several other classified missions uh, that they're responsible for. So that's kind of where Air Force Mars sits. And it's a really good place for Air Force Mars to sit because as requirements come in to the HFGCS, Air Force Mars is kind of their backup for contingency. So whenever there are, are meetings and things, there's always an opportunity for me to say, hey, Air Force Mars can do this and uh, it works out quite well. Today, Air Force Mars is comprised of nearly 700 Mars HF stations located in all 50 states. Again, these men and women of Air Force Mars are all volunteers. The chief, that would be me, is the only paid position in the entire organization. Not only are the members volunteers, but they also bring with them their own equipment. DOD and Air Force does not provide any equipment, and so they bring their own equipment, their own antennas, and everything. You know, and the, just like the average ham, the average Mars operator has thousands of dollars invested in their station equipment. This year, Air Force Mars is actually celebrating our 75th anniversary, and that will be happening in November of this year. We can trace our roots back to the auxiliary amateur radio system that was created in 1925 by Captain Thomas Reeves. At the time, Captain Reeves was a member of the United States Army Signal Corps. And his intent of organizing this program was to enlist the talents and volunteers of uh, radio operators to not only train soldiers but pursue radio research and the development to improve radio equipment in the Army. You can imagine back in those days with old tool type radios, they didn't probably fare too well going over a lot of bumps and things like that. So the auxiliary amateur radio system continued that mission set until the creation of the military affiliate radio system that occurred in November of 1948, and that established both separate Army and Air Force Mars programs, reflecting the creation of the Air Force as a separate service. Later, in August of 1962, the Navy Marine Corps stood up their Mars program. However, unfortunately, in 2009, at the direction of the Naval uh, commander the Naval Network Warfare Command, the Navy Marine Corps uh, program was shut down. So in today's DOD, there's Army Mars and Air Force Mars. That looks like Hoppy. Cool. That looks like Hoppy, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> We've come a long way. Uh, for the boat anchor fans in the crowd, I imagine you're probably drooling a little bit, or you might have even operated one of those radios. And we truly have come a long way, but we are keeping up with technology. This is a <clears throat> this is one of our current Mars members uh, station. I would say this is probably much more on the high end. <laughs> Uh, of the stations. I know it's a lot more than I have, I'll, I'll tell you that. Most stations typically consist of one or more HF transceivers, uh, antenna tuners, uh, power amplifier, and of course the computer. The long wire antenna is used by most Mars stations 
in a Nevis configuration because most of our activity is contained within a wing. So the way Mars is, is, is set up is the Mars program mirrors the FEMA regions. So if you're familiar with how FEMA is, is set up, Air Force Mars in what would be the fifth region for FEMA, which includes uh, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, that is wing five. So we have gone and we just recently did the reorganization and the reason we did that is because when leaders within the Air Force Mars program go to talk to Air Force leaders, we can talk about wings and we can talk about groups. The groups are individual states. So in Illinois, where I live, we're the 51st Air Force Mars Comp group. And that just helps us talk the talk to the Air Force leaders so they understand what we're talking about. Does he have to show up at work with that every time he comes in? <laughs> He's actually, that's his home station. So yeah, it's, it's there at his workplace, I guess, when he goes in. <clears throat> There is a requirement within one of our special operations group that you do have a steerable antenna. Now, we'll get into that a little bit later. <clears throat> In 2023, it's very safe to say that we are not your grandpa's Mars program. In the early days of the program, through the Vietnam War, the bulk of the Mars mission was health and welfare traffic. In fact, it's not uncommon uh, for me when I go out to various ham fests to have people come up and say, oh, Mars, I remember you guys. I got a Mars gram with so-and-so or was in their family with over in Vietnam or Korea. How many of you here maybe had Mars grams or got a Mars gram? A few? No? Okay. So when I first took the seat in March, I started looking into this, and what's amazing was, uh, at the time, each of the three separate services during the Vietnam War and during that time, each had about 5,000 Mars members. So total for the whole program was about 15,000 amateur radio operators who were serving in the Mars program. <clears throat> Since then, it has dropped off drastically. Times have changed, and with the t change in time and the advancement of, of computers, instant messaging capability, video chat, cell phones, and sat phones have all but eliminated the need for Mars grams. When I deployed into the desert in uh, the early 2000s, one of our members had his own personal sat phone. Mm -hmm. So, if you it's just changed. So the mission set assigned to Mars <clears throat> also had to change. You know, and as like I said, as technology technology advances, Mars continues to adapt and innovate. One of the things that uh, Air Force Mars just recently did was we fielded our own network operations software, NOS. NOS is the program that we use to send our traffic back and forth. It was developed solely by Air Force Mars members and at no cost to the DOD. <clears throat> so NOS, like I said, it formats and transmits and receives digital traffic. 99% of all of our message traffic nowadays is sent digitally. We use NOS uh, in cooperation with our data modem terminal that uses um, MIC 110, currently it's MIC 110 Alpha is the uh, mode that we use. And the software data terminal was also developed by a volunteer Mars operator and it's consistently updated to keep pace with the modernization efforts of the DOD HF radios. So right now, the current field of radio that most uh, 
Army and Air Force folks are using is a PRC-160. The PRC-170 is coming online, and it has some additional capabilities that is causing our software to be updated. So we're always trying to update it and keep pace with what's going on. <clears throat> this is a screenshot of our NOS software. And in the very top portion of the screen, it uh, displays the NOS inbox. So as traffic is being received, it goes into the inbox. And there are other options up at the top that you can click on. You can display the inbox, the outbox, which displays the message traffic that you have to send. And then there are a couple of other options uh, up there. The bottom half of the screen is the terminal window. So this is where we can actually read the text of the message that's coming into us or the text of the message that we're sending. NOS is also capable of functioning as a message center that allows um, Mars stations to drop off or pull a message from each station. And they do that through a series of commands that are typed down on the bottom bar. So NOS is a very uh, vital component. Uh, very soon we anticipate the fielding of an updated MSDFT modem uh, that will allow for NOS and MSDFT to talk together via TCP IP. Right now we use virtual COM ports, so that's another innovation and update that's going to happen with our NOS program. So we use mainly for transport media, we use HF radio, we do have VHF spectrum allocations, uh, we do have VHF repeaters that we use to support the program, and also we use ALE uh, a lot for our message uh, center traffic. <clears throat> Both Army and Air Force Mars traffic is fully interoperable, and we have all migrated to Mike 110 as the standard mode of digital message transmission. Of course, this is to ensure that we remain interoperable with our military component systems. Additionally, all message traffic is encrypted to prevent interception. Our software has been certified for the transmission of up to controlled, unclassified information. So if you're out on the bands and you're tuning around and you hear something, and you're like, what in the world is that message traffic? You'll be able to hear it but you will not, will not be able to decode it because it's all set encrypted. <laughs> One of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, what is, what is the mission of Mars? Now that, you know, I hear it a lot from the older folks uh, that were in the program, you know, back when the main mission was to send Mars grants. And one of the larger <laughs> emerging roles that I see Mars playing is in training. Um, the importance, <clears throat> come on, here. the importance and practicality of HF communications is resurfacing within the service components. So there, about 10, 15 years ago, they went, wow, this satcom, this satcom stuff is really cool, and so. DOD shifted and they put all their eggs into SATCOM. Well, with technology and changing, and now we understand that our, our adversaries are developing anti-SAT weapons with solar issues that we're all experiencing these days. They're understanding that maybe we made a little bit of a hasty judgment. The problem is that DOD shut down all the HF training schools. So we are there in the process of standing all that back up now and getting the schools back up and running. And I think I see that as a really good opportunity for Air Force Mars members to be able to help train our new HF operators. You know, you talked earlier about 
a couple of hundred years with just four or five people on your net for your bar, uh, for your mentoring net. You'll multiply that by about 30 or 40 people on a average Air Force Mars net with the experience that we have. And so it's a really untapped resource. One of the things that has happened is that Army Mars did stand up their HF Technical Assistance Lab out at uh, Fort Chukum. And they're doing really good work out there. David McGinnis uh, does some fantastic work uh, with the Army troops and the Air Force and all of the troops that go out to that HF Technical <laughs> Lab. And then the Air Force, we have a similar training option for our members, and that is the schoolhouse. And the schoolhouse is currently locate, relocating to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. Both of these schools are helping redevelop the skills that are needed by our warfighters in HF communications. <clears throat> One of the things that Air Force Mars and Mars does not do on a normal basis is we do not provide support to the local community. Um, we are a Title X asset controlled by the Department of Defense. However, there is uh, opportunities for us, if we are tasked, to provide support uh, for that. And that falls under the defense support to civil authorities. There are very specific uh, tasking orders that have to be issued in a very specific procedure for that to happen. But uh, we can provide uh, that kind of support if we're tasked. However, all Air Force Mars and all Mars operators are eligible to become credentialed SHARES resource high frequency HF radio program members. Um, and that program is, is administered by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, how many of you heard of the Share, SHARES HF? A few of you. Shares HF uses existing HF radio, radio resources to coordinate and transmit messages needed to perform critical functions, just like we do in the Mars program. And one of the things that the Mars operators bring to the Shares program is a very strong uh, HF net operating skills, and those skills are sought after by the Shares program. It's really easy for Mars operators to join the Shares program. And I highly encourage <clears throat> all of my members to take part in that program. It really is good. So what happens is we take off our Mars hat and we put on our Shares hat and we just keep right on the going. <clears throat> Here's some examples of some of the things that the Mars program has been involved in. I won't sit here and read them to you, but uh, you, can, you can certainly read through those. Hey! A couple of activities that uh, we've been doing over in Illinois is uh, we've operated and participated in Prairie Voice 2023 and 2022. And Prairie Voice is a statewide OXCOM exercise that involves all different uh, auxiliary communication entities throughout the entire state of Illinois. It is a National Guard uh, run program and exercise, and Air Force Mars has been playing a, a pivotal part in the HF operations for a couple of years now. We are cross-service compatible. Mars operators from both services are encouraged to participate in each other's operations. So Air Force Mars, within our wings and our groups, we have a number of different nets each day. Uh, within the fifth wing, I think we have at least five nets that occur every day. They start at 6 a.m. and the last net gets called at 8 p.m. and then there's nets all throughout the day. Our Army counterparts have a very similar program and we really encourage 
our Army members to come over to our nets and Air Force members to come over to their nets so that we learn how to work together and we remain interoperable. There are some annual events that occur uh, every year. Uh, within the MARS, the big MARS program that includes both Army and Air Force, there are four quarterly exercises that occur. These are joint exercises that are pushed down to us from NORTHCOM, and that involves participation of all MARS members. The exercise works in a, in a crawl, walk, run, type scenario where the first exercise of the, of the quarter is kind of a, a low-key exercise just to get everybody spun up, last maybe a couple of days over a weekend, and then the final, the capstone exercise, which occurs usually in October, will run an entire month. <clears throat> and you can see all of the different entities uh, that it involves. The other imp um, uh, annual event and that we participated in is the Armed Forces Crossband Test. How many of you have participated in, in the Armed Forces Day Crossband Test? Nobody. Oh my. So the Armed Forces Day Crossband Test is a really neat event <coughs> because what happens is the military stations, the Mars stations, we transmit on our military frequencies and then we listen down in the amateur band. So we're operating split. So for in order for the amateurs to talk to us, they have to run split also. And sometimes we get a little tricky. Um, all of Mars' uh, sideband activity is on upper sideband. Not so in the amateur band. So sometimes, like if we're on 40 meters, we'll be on our our military channel that's close to 40 meters in upper side band, but we'll be listening down on 40 meters in lower side band. So you have to figure out how to set your radio in order to get a hold of us. And what we do is the frequencies are published every year of where we're going to be operating, of the channels that we're going to be on. And then we make an announcement during the uh, exercise of where we're listening. So next year, be looking for that. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> I think uh, I think last year uh, we had around 30 to 40 military stations all over the, the continental United States that were participating in it. So it's a lot of fun. Quick question. Yeah. Do you have to be a bars member to participate? No. Because you're transmitting on your amateur bands and you're listening out on the military channels. So, yeah, that's a good question. As I said, uh, a normal Mars member on a normal ray day, we call it, there are wing traffic nets that occur daily, uh, group admin nets. We have all kinds of different nets and activities for people to be involved in. And you can see them there. So there's plenty to do and plenty of nets uh, to check into. So, so those nets that you have, are those like listenable to the general public or you encrypt them? Okay, so. nope. Yep. All Mars voice traffic right now is in upper side band and we are not currently using a MELP. Although there is some discussion about bringing MELP into the program, which would give us some digital voice encrypted technology. But currently, all the all the sideband is in upper side. What a good question. Melt is a digital voice uh, mode that is capable of being encrypted. So, yeah. Is that right on the back of the NOS as well? With that what? On, on the NOSS. MELP would actually be generated through the data modem terminal, which is MSDMT. Yeah. So, yeah. What frequency are you normally on when you're talking like this? So that's a great question that we get asked a lot. Unfortunately, I can't give out the frequencies because that's classified, uh, not classified, but it's controlled 
uh, unclassified information. So we have we keep very close tabs of of where our frequencies are. So, but good question. One of the very special operating groups that we have is Mars Radio, and Mars Radio is really one of the shining stars of, of the Air Force Mars program. Mar Mars Radio has both CONUS and OCONUS coverage, and what do they do? Mars Radio is the Air Force Mars phone patch net. Yes, we actually still do phone patches. And those foam patches occur mainly from our aircraft from all different branches of the Military Coast Guard and the Department of Homeland Security. This net is staffed uh, nearly 24-7 by trained volunteers uh, who are part of the Air Force and Army Mars program. Right now you can see they average a very large number of patches per month. 60% of those patches actually involve official business, however they do do morale calls. And if you're interested, they do have a website, marsradioglobal.us. And I'm going to leave this slide up because I actually have a couple of sound files that hopefully when I push this button will work. We'll see. set this up for you. Torch 33 is a B1B that has been tasked to provide a flyover to a Monday night football program in October of last year. During their inbound phase, they determined that they had lost comms with the controlling person that is at the stadium. So what do you do? You have no comms. Who do you call? Call Mars Radio. Torch uh, 33, I have your party on the telephone line. Start the patch on your end, sir, over. Uh, Torch 33, Torch 33, Torch 33, how do you hear that? Over. I got you all right clear right now, how about me? And you also want to clear, uh, Final call. Over. 
short uh, audio clip for you. This is an audio clip of another uh, foam patch that we recently did for a, a KC-135 tanker that uh, needed to get a phone call into the Moody Air Force Base uh, command post. We will be unable to refuel. 
So those are just two examples of a couple of phone patches that, that Mars Radio is involved in every day. Uh, if you go out to the website, which you see listed there, there are actually uh, several more audio files that are up there available for you to listen to if you'd like to. <clears throat> One of the other nets that we have is the Military Support Network. <clears throat> and the Military Support Network is basically a network that was stood up and is the entry point for our military components to get access into the Mars program. Um, so that is another, another net. It's a special net, and uh, that's available for volunteers to become a part of also. We also have a Mars station, multi-service Mars station, located at the Pentagon. And those uh, Pentagon station is up and running uh, uh, just about every day and they're actively participating in the Mars program. So, I invite all of you, if you have any interest at all in the Air Force Mars program, I have some uh, brochures that are available here. I'll be around uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have. If you have any interest at all, uh, if you want to join, there is a, uh, an age limit that you have to be 18 and, of course, hold a class, uh, any class of FCC amateur radio license. And if you don't have a license yet, you're in the right crowd to get one. Well, there's, a, there's our contact number. We have a uh, 888 number that you're welcome to call. Or you can send an email to join at mars-mil.us. That is, is the presentation. Is there an upper age limit? I'm <laughs> sorry, what? Is there an upper age limit? Absolutely not. If you can, if you're if you wake up on the right side of the grass in the morning, you're good to go. <laughs> That's a good question. I've never been asked that one before. Any other questions? I know I've so taken there is a lot a limit of time. Then. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, we've not had any spirits checked in. Who would know, right? Who would know? Yes, sir. Uh, so what would minimum requirements be to be able to participate? So that's a good question. Um, your radio has to, of course, have a Mars mod done to it so that you can operate outside of the normal amateur bands. Most of the uh, radios uh, that are available on the commercial market, you can have those modded. Uh, I don't recommend you do it yourself unless you're very skilled. Uh, I know that Gigaparts, ICOM, and uh, some of the other manufacturers offer that mod for you when you purchase the radio. Uh, the, the transceiver has to be able to transmit a minimum of 100 watts. We do not require that you have an amplifier and an antenna system that is capable of covering uh, in the Mars bands also. Basically anywhere from 1.2 up to 30 megahertz. Um, <clears throat> and then the other requirement of course is that all of our traffic is sent digitally so you need to have a sound card modem and computer system that is uh, Windows 10 and above uh, to run, run our software. So, any that's, other questions? That's just for the HF though, right? There's also a VHF component? That is, yeah, that's for the HF component. The VHF component is very limited and it's used mainly for uh, coordinating different types of uh, events. Uh, there's not a lot of VHF, VHF activity in the fifth wing. Uh, we do use it, like I said, locally to just kind of coordinate some of our activities on the nets. 
but 99% of the traffic is all set on HF. Yeah. I know Associated Radio in Kansas City will do the mods for about 50 bucks. Yeah, that's about the going rate. Some of the manufacturers now are uh, requiring a, a certificate of membership uh, before they'll do the mod. So uh, when you join the program, that's something that our national recruiting staff will go over with you. When you call that number or you send an email, uh, that will put you in touch with our national recruiting staff. Yeah. Did you say earlier that a directional antenna rotatable is required? The directional antenna requirement is for you to participate in Mars radio. Yes, sir. Otherwise, if you're not participating in Mars radio, then the normal antenna is a Nibis uh, configured antenna. Long wire. I've got a... Uh, so I've got two, uh, two HF antennas, two HF stations at my house. Um, one of them uses a just a standard dipole cut for one of the Mars frequencies, and so it's resonant there, and I use my antenna tuner to bring it in on the other one. The other one I just built, uh, it's for my uh, Motorola MyCom ALE HF radio, and it uses a uh, 18 to 1 ballon with a 1K ohm termination resistor, and then about 300 feet of wire, and I was really surprised. It's it, uh, if you go out and look for a, uh, it's like a modified. Uh, they call it a modified butterfly antenna. And when I put my MFJ analyzer on it, I went all the way down to 1.2, and the SWR was 1.4, 1.5. And I scanned all the way up to 30 mega, all the way up to six meters, and the highest SWR that I got was about 1.9. So I can use that on that Motorola MyCom. I scan on the ALE frequencies. I scan about 20 different frequencies, <laughs> and I do not have to have an antenna to it at all. So, yeah. What would be a typical or preferred time commitment for? A for a volunteer? That's another great question. So there is a minimum time uh, re requirement for our members, and that is currently it's 12 hours per quarter. Now, that may sound like a lot, but it's really not because you could get your hours very, very easily uh, because each net that you check into accounts for the actual net time most of our HF nets run an hour. And then we also give you credit an hour if you compose and send a piece of traffic during that net. So in one net, you can get two hours for checking in and sending a piece of traffic. And then if you're appointed an alternate net control or you are the net control, you get another hour. So there's three hours. So the time commitment is not really that much. Now I will tell you that Army Mars, I believe their time commitment is um, it's more than what we have and we are we are discussing that and looking at maybe we need to, to make some adjustments but still it would be very doable. Most of the time I would say the average Mars operator turns anywhere from 40 to 50 hours per month. So to get 12 hours and a quarter is not difficult. But good question. Yes, sir? Is it possible to make all or some of these slides available for download for like, future reference? As a matter of uh, fact, yeah. I'm going to send, yeah, I'll send yeah, the file to Mark. Mark, right? Kevin. Kevin. Ah. <laughs> there was yeah. a K in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. My wife has a about. trick that I didn't use with Kevin's, but now I will remember Kevin's name because I have used the trick that my wife told me <laughs> when I meet someone new whose name is Kevin. And Mark's so, back there. Mark's back there. <laughs> but yeah, I'll make sure that Kevin gets those different slides. Mm -hmm. so. I know I've kept you all for long, and I apologize, but is there any other questions? If we've got a few minutes, I'd like to expand on my experiences with that. Please, we'd love to hear from you. I was drafted into the Army in 1969. Sent to Vietnam, 
assigned to a little uh, heli self helicopter in, in Central Highlands. There were about 200 of us in this unit, in this compound. And there was a U.S. Air Force tank-finding radar facility in there. They had about a dozen people in there. But the Air Force had an Air Force Mars station set up with the equipment that nobody could operate. Be a ham operator, and I found that out. I went down and volunteered to open up the station and start running it. Got permission from the captain of the Air Force unit there. And it turned out most of the Air Force guys there were only on the TDY there. They'd come there for three months, then you'd go back to the Philippines and rotate through, and their families were in the Philippines. But I set this Mars station up, and it was an Air Force Mars station. Prefix for all the Air Force Mars stations in Vietnam was AIA, Alpha India 8. And there were about a dozen Air Force Mars stations. One where I was was Alpha India 8, Alpha Q. And all the stations had Collins radio equipment there. They had two Collins KWM2A transceivers, all two. One Collins 30S1, one 30L1, 1000 and 2001 amplifiers. We had one <coughs> long wire antenna, and we had one high gain brand log periodic antenna there, and it was always aimed at the United States. And we operated on nets, on Air Force Mars crews, which were right outside of 20 meters, some 15, just outside the hamlet. The frequency was very strict. We were not allowed to, uh, we had noise and interference on the frequency. We had to struggle through it. We were not allowed to move off those frequencies at all. And it was all up a side band. We operated through net control stations in the United States, uh, which all had Collins equipment too, from uh, <coughs> Collins Radio Company, General Dynamics. I had two favorite stations that I would go to. One of them was at North American Rockwell's World Headquarters in Anaheim, California. And their call sign was AFC6YPX. And they had an amateur radio club that was employees of North American Rockwell. They manned that Mars station for the strict purpose of providing phone patches to uh, to Mars stations in Vietnam. And they manned it 24 hours a day with their employees who were hands. And the other station that I, was my favorite was AFA-7 UGA, and that was Barry Goldwater's car. He had a station set up in Scottsdale, Arizona, the same way. He got Collins to donate the hand foot. And he formed a club to man that station 24 hours a day for the purpose of running phone patches to the United States. And, those were, and I occasionally ran through Scott Air Force Base with Mars Station, but it was unreliable as having somebody there operating. And the calls were all free to the soldiers in Vietnam. The stations in the United States would make collect calls to the families. And then the, the families would make pay for a collect call. But it didn't take me long to figure out if you call through uh, North American Rockwell Station in Anaheim, after their normal business hours from their headquarters, they switched their watch line. And their watch lines over to the station. And all the Mars calls from Vietnam were free the soldiers. And Barry Goldwater paid for all, somehow got the calls for all of the soldiers who were making calls into uh, Arizona were free. And he also did it for the Mars operator. I made all my calls through those two stations after hours, and all the guys that made the calls through my station. And I did that not too long before my commanding officer relieved me of my guard duty at the card station, relieved me of all duties, and assigned me to run this Air Force Mars station on Army Commander after 
he got to make a crystal clear call through his wife mm -hmm. in the wedding hour. <laughs> <laughs> he had heard about the Mars station. Uh, you know, he, he told some of his people that he'd like to make, he wish he could make a call to his wife. And he told him about the Mars station. He came down there and they didn't, I let him call him as he wanted. It was crystal clear. I never pulled guard duty after that. <laughs> but we had, uh, you know, there was no AT&T, no satellite. The only way to communicate home was a letter which took eight days to get there, or a Mars call. So it was 1969 and 70. So uh, we got a lot of Red Cross priority calls. Guys would show up and get that Dear John letters from their wives. And those were the hardest ones. Uh, typically, we would allow a phone call to be five minutes long because we had some people. And, but we let the Air Force, the uh, Red Cross priority calls, go long. And I kind of used my own judgment as to whether the call, even if it wasn't an Air Force Mars call. But it was something that really needed to be done. I'd let them longer too. But we would uh, go through the stations in the United States, the Mars stations. We would give them five listings at a time the phone number to call, the person there, and who was making the call in Vietnam. And uh, they would have five stations in Vietnam on the same frequency. So they'd gather the information for 25 calls, and they would do the first one from each of the five stations in Vietnam, then they'd go back to the second one and rotate through. So once you did a phone call, you had the link of four other phone calls from the other four stations in Vietnam to prep your person for his next call. Every once in a while, there'd be some no answers and kind of go through really worked real well, and our com communications was much clearer than these calls that you hear here. I mean, we used uh, these 2,000 watts, block periodic antenna, when band conditions are the best, twice a day, they were skilled. And they did the same thing in the United States, so they were crystal clear. The biggest problem was getting the new people who hadn't made a call before here in to say over. <laughs> so us operating, we got to where we were saying over a lot just out to avoid the confusion. But they were a big morale booster. And one of the stations, the station in Anaheim, had a guy, a young guy who worked there, his name was Keith. He operated there in all of his off times. So he and I became good friends, never met, knew her boards, and just just like now when you're on the radio with people, you know their voice when you hear And I would be talking to him, and I got to where I had to watch the things I said to him, because every once in a while he'd say, well, Carl, say hello to your wife, Ruth. She's been listening to us for 10 minutes. <laughs> because I was in a small area. Again, only 200 people there in two places in Vietnam, this compound. So I would frequently run out of people to make phone calls. And he had my wife's, where she worked, her phone number, her parents, where she lived, her sister's number. And he had my parents' number, my brother's <coughs> number. And I never, he wrote them down because I'd call them all the time when there was nobody else to make a call. I didn't let it go to waste. Absolutely. So, uh, got so, uh, became such good friends. My wife and I decided we, was, we might name our first born. Mm -hmm. But we didn't. <laughs> uh, you can borrow it at time. Yeah. But, uh, Gary Buck Barry Goldwater <clears throat> sent a QSL card, a Christmas card, to my wife with a real nice letter explaining to her what morale building and what good I was doing in Vietnam for the troops. Of course, she cried when she did it. We still have it. We still have that letter from uh, Barry Goldwater. And it was just. I had so many good experiences doing that for my fellow ham, for my fellow soldiers. It was just a morale boost for me. So many of them hadn't heard from their family in six months or eight months. 
I got to talk to him here in Crystal Clear. It was really a, a moving experience for a lot of them. Needless to say, there was an Air Force mess hall there and an Army mess hall. And I got to eat any mess hall I wanted to eat. <laughs> most of the time I wanted. <laughs> and the Air Force has customarily got better living conditions than the Army, period. I mean, they had nice housing there. They had a tape library, hundreds of real to real tapes and real to real Sony decks. If you could get the blank tapes, you could record this. Well, so, as far as they was concerned, I was an Air Force guy. Because I was making phone calls to the Air Force guys that wouldn't have been able to make them if I hadn't been to that. And I remember one of the guys said, Carl, you know, well, he called me Lee. Everybody calls you last name. He says, I got to tell you, you have changed my attitude. He said, I always considered Army guys as being like ground pounders and stuff. He said, you've changed my whole attitude about what I thought about the Army for running the station. I found out Army guys weren't too bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, they got to eat in their mess halls, had a great time. Shortly after I got home, I found out through uh, Department of Defense, he got stuff in the mail from me. I'd been put in for a bronze star for achievement. And it was like a three page letter that my commanding officer had written because of the morale building uh, benefit it did all the troops. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then when I got back, I got into Air Force Mars back here in the States. So I was, over there, I was AIA AK. And then Air Force Mars called back here. It was, AFB 3AY. And I did that for several years. But um, that's a little bit about my experience with Air Force One. Well, thank you for wow. sharing that. And yeah. one other thing, I, when I got back here, at that time, you had your minimum requirements, but that was easy to do. Yeah. Uh, the government published a book every month, or three months, about that of government surplus materials. And if you were up to date on your Air Force Mars hours, you could order things that were surplus. And if any other organization, we were Air Force, our Mars period was on the bottom of the total pole for priority. But if nobody else wanted to get what you wanted, you got it. I ended up getting five miles harder than 300 foot spoons. And it was someplace else in the country government shipped all of those wow. to Scott Air Force Base that we go pick up. Yeah. These were 300 foot spools, cylinder spools, wooden spools, big spools. <laughs> and uh, it took several trips with me and a couple of my buddies to go get that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up having to go see a chiropractor. <laughs> 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 we were a pipe and running it through yeah. those wooden spools and carrying it. And we ended up using that on the repeaters. And guys uh, couldn't sell it. I wouldn't feel right selling it anyway. Right. But I gave it to a lot of my ham friends to use on, uh, on their ham station. I also got an IBM Selectric 2 typewriter oh through that was surplus sure. that uh, nobody else wanted. So I got that. And I got several other things, a signal generator. Hewlett-Packard signal generator and several other things through Air Force Mars. Just patients. I don't know if they still do that. Unfortunately, <laughs> that program is no longer there. It's yeah. no longer there. Yeah, it's not. But uh, I have lots of good memories. Yeah, from from my Air Force Navy, our Air Force Mars days as an Army operator. Well, How come you didn't take home the uh, radios? Yeah. <laughs> well. I didn't, uh, I, had, I was happy with it. Oh, I've got a call that's KWM2 oh. now. But I did not get it for Air Force One. But I got it way back then. It was built in 1962. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah, for sharing cool. very much. I appreciate it. And let's, our... let's thank everyone who is in here who served in the military for their service. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I really enjoyed my time 10 years in the Army and then 10 years in the Air Force Reserve. 
I enjoy every minute of it. And you're right. The Air Force usually has a little better living conditions. <laughs> when, I, when I deployed over to the desert, I was 10 minutes away from having to spend my first night in a tent. The guy walked in and threw his key down to the room, and I grabbed that and said, I'll take that room and off I went. So. <laughs> Talking about the mess halls, too. Oh, you know, yeah. Operating. Yeah. They, uh, I tell the guys, I need to stop for a while. I've got to go eat. Yeah. I haven't had anything to eat. They would go to the mess hall and get food and bring it up to me so I could have to stop operating. And the guys in the mess hall you know, took good care of me. Well, again, I've got some brochures here. I've got my business cards. So thank you all so much for being so attentive. I'm sorry for going so long.